So, so far we've been evaluating a representative firm. We've taken a look at their production function. We have taken a look at their cost structure. However, we haven't quite got at their fundamental assumption, right? Our fundamental assumption as to why firms even exist. And that is profit maximization, right? We have not yet looked at how a firm profit maximizes, how they determine their optimal quantity that they're going to produce and at what price. We've just kind of taken a look at this generic costs, these generic production functions. So what we're going to do today is we're going to take together all of that bit we looked at, our production function, our costs, and we're now going to introduce, we're now going to dictate to the firm a price. So, hey, what's the price of an apple? And then from that price of an apple, we're going to determine, or an apple orchardist, right, so some firm, how many apples they're going to produce. Specifically, what we're going to be looking at here is one specific type of market structure, one specific type of uh, firm, and we're going to refer to that as perfect competition. And from a perfectly competitive firm, we're then going to determine how much that firm produces or how much they would supply to the market. And then we're going to use all of this to kind of create what we're going to get to, which will be a market supply curve. So this market supply curve will be the first half of our conversation. The second half of our conversation will be in the coming weeks, which will be, well, we're talking about producers. Let's flip to talk about consumers. And instead of market supply, we'll be taking a look at market demand. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Today, we're looking at perfect competition. In this video, we'll go farther into that, how much quantity our perfectly competitive firm will supply to the market, and how we would determine that market supply curve as a result. So without further ado, let's go take a look at this topic. So as we said in today's video, we're going to be taking a look at a specific type of firm. And that specific type of firm is going to be a firm in a perfectly competitive, uh, perfectly competitive market. And I'm just going to abbreviate market as MKT for short because, well, writing long words takes a long time. So perfectly competitive market. And it's like, okay, well, what do we mean by this perfectly competitive market? What's going on here? Well, yeah, we're going to get to that. What we're going to be doing is we're going to start off today by taking a look at some determinants of market structure and perfect competition or a perfectly competitive market is a type of market structure. We're then going to take a look at these determinants and apply these determinants to how we witness uh, the way that perfectly competitive firms behave or what they are kind of bound to. From that, we're going to go back to our cost curves. We're going to be taking a look at what this all means in relation to our cost curves on whole. We'll play around a bunch with our cost curves and how that all works out, finding, hey, how much do we produce? Say, the example we used was apples. How many apples should the orchardist produce given a seven, uh, given price that the market tells them? From then, we're going to talk about what this means in the short run, what this means in the long run. We're going to identify different points on the curve. We're going to identify this shutdown condition. And then we're going to finish off with a derivation of the short run supply curve. So first, let's just quickly remind ourselves our fundamental assumption as to why firms exist. Our fundamental assumption as to why firms exist is that they exist, and this is for all market structures, but let's just reiterate that, a perfectly competitive firm, they will exist to maximize their profit. And keep in mind, right, this little Greek letter pi, we use that to denote profit. And again, when we're talking about profit, we're actually talking about economic profit. So that's explicit as well as implicit costs being, again, to use that word again, explicit and implicit costs implicitly being worked out in our cost functions. Right, and so far, as we worked out profit, we said total revenue minus total cost. What have we done so far? We've opened up total revenue. We've said, hey, this is price times quantity. We then opened up quantity and we said, hey, quantity, this is going to be some function given our technology of labor and capital. We said, okay, if we're dealing with firms in the short run, which is going to be predominantly where we deal, capital is going to be fixed, meaning the only thing we can change is labor. 
as we change our labor. Well, that goes into our production function, the magic happens, and our quantity changes. So as we change our workers, we change our output. And that relationship between the two, that was demonstrated with our product curves. So keep in mind, that was our average product of labor and our marginal product of labor. From there, we then jumped over to our total cost curves, and we opened these up to take a look at our cost functions. And all together, we then took a look at the relationship between our average total cost, average fixed cost, and average variable cost. Finally, right, one of the big ones there, our marginal cost. And keep in mind, marginal cost is going to be the big one because going back up here, our fundamental assumption is that yes, firms exist to maximize their profit, but there is a little add-on statement to that, and that was yes, they exist to maximize their profit, and they will do so in the margin. So that is in those incremental changes. So, okay, you'll take a look at all this and you'll say, great, Keith, we've taken a look at all of this, but we've yet to talk about this price aspect. Well, that's what we're going to take a look at today. And it turns out the ability to choose this price or the effect that this price has on our whole profit maximization situation all comes back to what type of market structure we have. So in this case here, it's all going to come back to the fact that we are in a perfectly competitive market. So, okay, bit of review, huge roundabout way. Let's talk about this perfectly competitive market. And let's talk about that by taking a look at our determinants of market structure. Uh, I was going to scroll down. Let's just start a new page here. So to start off, our determinants. De determinants of market structure. And I'm going to introduce all four determinants. I'm going to introduce, based off of these four determinants, all of the different types of market structure we'll end up looking at through this course. We're looking at perfect competition today. We won't be looking at the other three until much later in the course, so don't get too caught up on the other three. It's just kind of to be there to be like, hey, we will take a look at these guys as well. But First, right, first let's take a look at these determinants. Determinants of market structure. So our first determinant is going to be uh, the number and size of firms. So that is in the market on whole, how many firms do we have and how large are the firms? And here's a big thing to keep in mind, right? When we're talking about size of the firm, we're not talking about, hey, how many employees do they have? We're not talking about, like, how much physical space they take up. What we're referring to with size of the firm is that firm's, so the firm's quantity supplied, little Q subscript S. So how much quantity the firm could supply to the market? versus our market quantity supplied, right? So that is, does our firm supply a lot of goods to the market on whole? Like, hey, is this market, sorry, not is this market, is this firm, is this something like 25% of market supply? Right? In that case there, wow, that one firm, that's supplying a quarter of the market. That'd be massive, right? That'd be, that'd be a pretty large firm. So we'd say the size would be large. But hey, what if this firm, what if their quantity supplied is just a drop in the bucket, right? That is, if this firm produces as much as it can, or if it went bankrupt and closed, the market would hardly notice. That is, let's say this is something like 0 0.5% of market supply? Well, okay, if it's 0.5% of market supply, we would say, and again, I'm just picking numbers generically here. There's not gonna be any cutoff that we kind of look at in this course. We would say, hey, this is gonna be a small firm. They're providing a very small amount of that total market supply. Right, rather than think about it in this percent term, you can pretend, hey, 
all together in the market, let's say there is one, uh, let's keep up with our apples, one million, and let's go, one million, oh my goodness, let's write that a little bit better. One million pounds of apples being supplied to the market. Okay, so one million pounds of apples all together being bought and sold within this market. And let's say that our firm, our firm, let's just make some room for that. Our firm, they are able to supply something like 10,000 pounds. Right, in this case here, 10,000 pounds in relation to the million altogether being supplied, yeah, it's gonna be relatively small. You know what, that might be even a little bit on the larger side of small. We could be still being a lot of apples being produced, but we could drop that down to 1,000 pounds of apples. Right, and again, don't get too caught up in the numbers. We're not gonna be looking at some kind of cutoff. I know that question will come up. Hey, what cutoff makes it a small firm towards a large firm? Don't, don't get caught up with that. Really what we're just gonna be getting at is that there's tons being produced here and this firm, eh, not, not very many being produced altogether. So okay, spent a lot of time going through that. Number and size of firms, this is our first determinant. First determinant there. Let's just get rid of that guy. Okay, our second determinant, what's our second determinant here? Our second determinant is whether or not we have product differentiation. And let's talk about what that means in a second. And I, I do want to kind of add a caveat to this. Product dif differentiation, and I'll say in the eyes of the consumer. And this isn't something that you'll usually see in a textbook, but this is something that I really find important to add on to this. And let's talk about what we mean by product differentiation and hopefully this will become clear. So what product differentiation means is, is there a difference between the products, right? Differentiation, difference. And so to evaluate this, let's talk again. Just keep the same thing going. Let's talk about apples. And even more generically, right, we can talk about one type of apples because there's lots of different types of apples out there. Let's talk about gala apples. So, right, we have all of these different orchardists. Maybe we have a hundred different orchardists in the area that all grow apples. Gala apples, to be specific. When you go to the store to buy apples, or even a fruit stand to go and buy apples, is there any way that you can tell? Oh, this apple came from Farmer Brown versus this apple came from Farmer George? No, right? The apples, the gala apples from Farmer Brown versus the gala apples from Farmer George, in your eyes, right, the eyes of the consumer, they're identical. There's no differentiation between them. They're just gala apples. You can't tell which orchardist they came from. However, if you were to talk to the orchardists, Farmer Brown might feel that he does a lot more work on his orchardist. He might feel that he takes a lot better care of his trees. Farmer Brown might feel that he has a superior product, right? But irrespective of that, it doesn't matter because in the eyes of the consumer, they are just gala apples. They cannot be differentiated based off of the orchardist that provided them. Compare and contrast that with our smartphone market. Right, if we compare and contrast that with our smartphone mark market, there is a difference, right? And you can take a look at the big kind of macro difference and the fact that we have Apple versus Android. And okay, okay, keep in mind here, this Apple is different than these apples, right? This is Apple like Macintosh computers Apple versus Apple's the type of apples you actually eat. So. Okay, maybe a bit of confusion happening there, but very, very different products going on. Right, in this case here, if you buy an Apple iPhone, well, okay, that's going to be very different than an Android, and you can differentiate between these goods. Even if we go into the Android market, well, right, we have all of these different providers. We have LG, we have Huawei, did I spell that right? I hope I spelled that right. Right, we have others, we have our Samsung. Samsung and etc. 
etc. Right? We have lots of different companies, firms, all providing Android phones, right? They're essentially the same operating system. But yet, even though they're all operating, they're all offering Android phones there is still differentiation that occurs between the different firms. Some people have a preference for Samsung for certain reasons. Other people have a preference for Huawei. Others have a preference for LG, etc., etc., etc. So differentiation here in the eyes of the consumer, the consumer believes that an LG phone is different than a Samsung phone. Whether or not that's true, well, again, it's all about the view of the consumer. So that's what we mean when we're talking about product differentiation. Well, let's make some room here. Our third point. Third point here. Uh, we have lots of small firms, or sorry, we have number and size of firms. We have degree of product differentiation. Our third point is going to be whether or not we have barriers to entry. So whether or not we have barriers to entry, what this is referring to is how easy it is for a new firm to enter the market. To be like, hey, wow, Apple Orchardists are making tons of money. That sounds like a good business to get into. I'm going to start an Apple Orchard. Or, hey, smartphone manufacturers, they're making killer returns. I want to get into the smartphone manufacturing business, right? Depending on how easy it would be to get into that industry is the barrier. So what we're going to be taking a look at with this, pretty simply, we're going to be taking a look at either that we have barriers or we don't have barriers. So either no barriers or barriers, right? These two kind of just extreme cases, either the barriers are on or the barriers are off, right? In reality, we're going to have these kind of um, spectrum of barriers that exist. But we're on an intro course, we're just going to simplify it between these two. Um, one thing to keep in mind, this often comes up, generally speaking, again, generally speaking, there are going to be some exceptions to this, but generally speaking, our startup cost, startup cost is not a barrier. Right, like some people are looking at, wow, yeah, sure, orchardists are making tons of money, but that's eh, pretty expensive to start an orchard. You have to buy the land, you have to buy the tractor, you have to buy all the trees, get them planted, you have to wait for them to grow, etc., etc., etc. That's a huge cost. Yeah, 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 okay, that, that that is a huge cost, right? That's part of our cost function, but it's not necessarily a barrier to entry. Right, our barriers to entry are going to be other things that are going to prevent new entrants from coming in. We'll kind of assume, and right, this is kind of a waving of hands assumption in our case. Well, we're going to kind of assume that, hey, if I wanted to start an orchard, I could put together a business plan, go to the bank, and the bank would give me that money to start up an orchard. A little bit of a grand assumption, but we'll pretend that's the case. Final, final determinant, and this one here, we can almost just kind of like introduce it and then eh, not do too much with it. Our final determinant is going to be whether or not um, I'll just write information. Information. And what we're going to have is we're going to have either perfect information which is really what we're going to assume for the majority of this course is that all consumers, all producers have perfect information. That is, as a consumer, hey, I know exactly the quality and exactly the price and all the information I need to know about the Apple that I'm buying. And I know that, hey, if you're charging this price for an Apple, I know the price that every other producer is charging for their Apples. I know the quality of all of them and I can make my decision accordingly, right? So there's perfect information. All relevant information is known and can be accessed. From the producer or the firm's viewpoint, this means that all technology is shared, right? If Farmer George finds some new great way to make apples cheaper, make apples better, well then Farmer Brown also has information to that, has information, Farmer Brown also has access to that information and is able to implement that himself. 
So perfect information means that information is perfectly transmitted, easily, readily transmitted between all economic agents without any cost, without any asymmetry. The opposite of that, of course, would be asymmetric information. And we will introduce this, just kind of to talk about it at a later point. This is a really interesting field of study for those of you who are interested. Asymmetric information would take a look at what happens when certain economic agents have access to information that others don't, and how they can use that access to information to get an outcome that maybe fits them better. Uh, let's, let's just scroll down so that's all visible. There we go. So there we go. We have our two types of information for our course, except for when we just kind of introduce and talk about this guy. We're actually always going to assume that we have perfect information, which means that truthfully, when we go through our different types of market structure, it's only going to be these three determinants up top, which are changing. So these three are going to change, which are going to create our different, our different market structures that we'll evaluate. For determinant four, here we will always assume perfect information. So let's take a look at the impact that that has. Let's take a look specifically at perfect competition. So we have our perfect competition. This is the guy we're going to be looking at in today's video in detail. And we are going to assume that a perfectly competitive market has lots of small firms. All right, so there's going to be lots and lots and lots of them. So hundreds, maybe even hundreds of thousands of apple orchards all across the province, let's say. And each one provides a relatively small amount of product to the market. That is, if the market altogether is like 10 million pounds of apples, each one maybe provides 1,000 pounds. That is, every individual firm is a drop in the bucket. The market does not notice any one firm. The individual firms are insignificant on their own. That's the big part there. Second assumption is that all of these tiny firms are going to sell homogenous goods. You're like, whoa, homogenous, that's, that's a $10 word. What does that mean? Okay, homogenous just means all the same, right? So all the goods being sold by all of these tiny firms are identical, again, in the eyes of the consumer. So right, again, to think about that, we have our gala apples. When you go to the store to buy your gala apples, they're probably coming from, right, the two apples sitting right next to each other in the bin could very likely be coming from different orchards. You have no idea. You have no way to differentiate between that. They look the same. There's no differentiation between these gala apples. So all the goods from all the firms are identical in the eyes of the consumer. Finally, and okay, I say finally, but we do have the other one. Um, finally, we're going to presume that we have no barriers to entry. That is, if I wanted to start an apple orchard, I could. If apple orchardists are making killer returns or making huge profits, and I want to look at starting a business, hey, that looks like a good spot. I can get into the business. I can start my own apple orchard and start making my own money off of that. So there's no barriers. There's nothing to prevent me from entering. In the same way, if I'm losing money as an apple orchardist, there's nothing to prevent me from leaving. So that's our big thing, is there's no barriers to prevent entrance. There's no barriers to prevent exit. Our final determinant, and again, this one's going to hold through all of our market structure, is that I'm going to have perfect information. And truthfully, we can just kind of omit this one because this is going to stay the constant through all of our market structure. Perfect information. That is, consumers know everything that there is to be known about the good, and firms all have access to the same technology, all have access to the same production process, all firms have the exact same cost profile as a result. So all information that's available is perfectly, readily, and completely available. Big assumption. 
but one that will hold through the whole thing. First three are what's going to change. We'll talk about these in detail as to what they mean for perfect competition, what they mean for our cost curves, but let's take a look at our different types of market structure altogether and how these three determinants end up influencing them. Okay, so on our continuum, we are going to have altogether four types of market structure. So we're going to have one extreme on the left, we'll have another extreme on the right, and then we'll have two types here in the middle. To start off, we're going to have our, what we're going to be taking a look at today, our perfect competition. And what I'll do underneath is I'll add in our determinants of market structure for each market structure, but I want to list them all first. So perfect competition, where we're going to start today, Big thing, whenever you see this word perfect, it is likely a abstraction from reality. It is likely not something we see very often. It's just kind of a theoretical construct to explain kind of this extreme situation. Um, we do witness firms pretty close to perfect competition, but it explains a lot of firms pretty well. But again, it's likely an abstraction. On the other extreme, we're going to have our monopoly. So we'll take a look at that next and we'll list our market structure as well. What we're then going to have in the middle, we're going to have what we're going to call, hey, if this is if this is perfect competition, our two in the middle here are often referred to as imperfect competition. And these two in the middle is going to be our monopolistic competition and or our oligopoly. That's a fun word to say. Oligopoly. So we'll take a look at all these as the course progresses. Perfect competition today. We'll then move away from market structure for a little bit and then we'll come back and take a look at monopoly and then our imperfectly competitive market structures. What do we have going on in each one? Well, okay, perfect competition we already took a look at. We have lots of small firms. We have a homogenous product. So homogenous good. Again, what does that mean? It means that in the eyes of the consumer, every firm makes the exact same good. Right, we've talked a lot about apples. Maybe this is blank paper, right, or lined paper. In the eyes of the consumer, lined paper is lined paper. Doesn't matter who the producer is, it's just paper. So, in the eyes of the consumer, every firm produces the exact same good. Finally, uh, we're going to presume no barriers. Firms, entrepreneurs are free to enter, they're free to leave. There's nothing preventing movement in or out of this market. To jump in then to the next one, monopolistic competition. And again, we'll spend a lot of detail on each of these, so don't get too caught up with them. We're just going to introduce the basics right now. We'll regal through this spectrum as we carry on. Monopolistic, where again, we're going to have lots of small. So again, lots of small firms. So very, very similar there. In this case here, we're going to have a slightly differentiated good. So that is each firm is going to have their own take on a good. And these are going to be just a little bit different from firm to firm. So there will be a degree of product differentiation. Finally, and this, this does vary from textbook to textbook. This does vary depending on how detailed the course wants to get into it. In our case, we are just going to make our, because we just said, hey, on or off for barriers. We're just going to say no barriers. In reality, though, and sometimes some courses, some textbooks will get more into detail with this at the 103 level. We may talk about it a little bit, but... Sometimes there's limited or weak barriers that exist in this monopolistic competition case. But for our purposes, we're going to assume no barriers.
Just will keep things easier once we get there. Oligopoly. Well, for an oligopoly, moving on, we're going to have a... Oh, that's not how you spell that. Let's try again. We are going to have a few large firms. So maybe just a handful, right? Maybe that means 10. Maybe that means three. We're going to have a few large firms. Uh, these few large firms, they may or may not have a differentiated product. That is, product differentiation is not necessarily going to be a defining feature of this market. Uh, the defining feature of this market structure is the fact that there are a few large firms, just a few of them, and they're splitting the market between themselves. Final one, we are going to assume there's barriers. So that is, there's something that is existing in this market that is preventing newcomers, an entrepreneur, from entering into this and getting at the profit these firms are earning. So barriers are going to exist. Final one, well, okay, our final one here is a monopoly. This is just one large firm, right, mono one, so one large firm. In this case here, uh, this one's kind of interesting because there's one large firm. They're the only one selling that good. So you could say, yeah, there's going to be kind of this extreme product differentiation because, well, it's so differentiated from anything else that there's no other alternative. You either buy this monopolist's version of the product or you just don't have access to it. And finally, we're going to have, with the case of a monopoly, typically we're going to have barriers. We would often say these are very large barriers. Very, very large barriers. So, okay, you're probably looking at these and you're like, okay, cool, what do all these mean? Let's give you a brief example in the Canadian context of an example of firms in each case here. And... So to do this example, let's start off on the far left here. Let's talk about our perfect competition. So examples of perfectly competitive firms. This is going to be a lot of agriculture. Right, a whole bunch of different farmers all growing wheat. Well, more or less, wheat is wheat. It doesn't really matter which farm it comes from. It is just wheat that gets turned into flour, grains, etc. So agriculture is going to be modeled as perfect competitive. That's where we talked a lot about an orchardist making apples. Uh, very similarly, really agriculture, we could throw into this other natural resources as well. Natural resources. So typically speaking, oil is oil. Now, okay, yes, we do have a difference between, say, the oil from Alberta versus the oil from Texas versus Saudi oil, on and on and on. They're differing weights, right? There's different levels of impurity in them. But more or less, we can kind of wave our hands if there's little differences, and we can say, yeah, oil is oil. Natural gas is natural gas. Gold is gold. Coal is coal. Electricity is electricity, right? In all of these cases, we'll kind of wave our hands at the little differences that do exist, and we're just going to say, hey, these are perfectly competitive. Any of those small differences are so tiny that they're not really going to impact us. So some examples of perfectly competitive firms. Moving over to monopolistic competition. Well, monopolistic competition, this is going to be like our restaurants. Right, restaurants, these are a great example of monopolistically competitive firms. Think about are big fast food chains, uh, right? Let's say we have McDonald's, we have Burger King, we have A&W, we have Wendy's. They all make burgers, right? They all offer burgers, fries, and soft drinks. Same kind of thing. But although we have lots of these small firms, yeah, okay, you're like, oh, but McDonald's is pretty big. Yeah, yeah, it is. It doesn't quite perfectly fit in this case here, but it's it's not far off. We have lots of these chains all offering a slightly differentiated good, that is they all offer burgers, but they all have their own take on the burger. 
The big thing with this, though, is that, right, if we're going to talk about McDonald's, only McDonald's can sell a Big Mac. They have a monopoly over their version of the cheeseburger, which they've called the Big Mac. Only Burger King can sell the Whopper. Only A&W can sell the Teen Burger, on and on and on. They all just have burgers, but they have a monopoly over their version of it. And so monopolistic competition explains that. Oligopolies then. Well, in Canada, if we wanted to take a look at oligopolies, we could be taking a look at our banking sector. Right in Canada, our big six banks, that's TD, Royal Bank, CIBC, Bank of Nova Scotia, National Bank. Uh, was that all six of them? Maybe I missed one. Our big six banks, if I recall, they account for about 92% of all market share. That is, out of all the funds in Canada, 92%, and again, that number might be wrong, I'm just going off of my memory here, about 92% of all of the money held is held in one of those big six banks. So that is all of those credit unions, Casta Populaire, all of the other ones that exist, well, they're so small that they're not even really relevant. Our big six really are the market. And there's only six, and they are large with respect to the total quantity. About whether or not there is product differentiation, well, some would argue there may be slight product differentiation between those big six banks. Others would say, ah, banking services are banking services. It's all identical. So Canadian banking sector would definitely be oligopolistic. And we'll talk about the barriers that exist there, but there's actually significant barriers in our Canadian system as well for that. Another example would be telecom. Right, telecom, this is cellular mobility access. In Canada, really all we have is TELUS, Rogers, and Bell. We've recently had the newcomer of Shaw, but they're pretty small so far. Even with them coming in, we still only have a few large firms. And then you might be like, well, wait, Keith, no, no, no. We have, right, again, if you're thinking about the Canadian market, we have TELUS, Rogers, Bell. And you're like, well, don't we also have... Kudo, Freedom, uh, what else do we have? Fido, all of these other guys as well. Yeah, we do. They're actually, if you didn't know, they're just subsidiaries of TELUS, Rogers, and Bell. That is, they're owned by TELUS, Rogers, and Bell. They're just operated as their own sub-brand. So, again, still just a few large firms that dominate this market. Finally, our monopolies. Uh, some examples of monopolies. Well, here in Canada, we're going to have... Canada Post, right? That's that's a monopoly. They're the only provider of first-class mail. We have, uh, if you're familiar with here on the island, we're going to have BC Ferries. Uh, we're going to have BC Hydro. On and on and on and on. There's actually going to be a lot of these monopolies that exist in Canada. What you'll notice so far with the three that I've listed is they're actually all crown corporations. That is... They're public companies that are run. They have been given a charter to operate by the government. And we'll talk about why that's the case once we get to looking at monopolies. But right, if we take a look at BC Ferries, those of us who live on the island and have dealt with BC Ferries, or even if you live in the lower mainland, Vancouver, and have dealt with BC Ferries, this is your only option. If you want to get off the island or to the island with a vehicle, BC Ferries is the only provider of vehicle ferry service between the Lower Mainland and the island. So they have a monopoly over that good. There's no other differentiation. There's no other similar service available. So they have a monopoly over that. Okay, so overview of where we're going in this course, overview of what's to come. Again, today in this week's series of videos, we're going to be focusing in on perfect competition and what this means for us. So let's take a look at that. So perfect competition, let's talk about what exactly this means for us. The fact that we have lots of small firms, the fact that we have homogenous goods, they're all the same, and the fact that there's no barriers. What these three things actually influence us for Sorry, the way that these three determinants end up influencing our market 
is through two, two kind of facets. First, it means that firms under this market structures are price takers. That is whatever the market price works out to be. And we'll, in a few chapters, we'll take a look at how this market price is determined. Whatever this market price happens to be, the firm just has to accept that. That is, they have no influence over the market price. They're too small. They are too small to influence the market. They're insignificant. They on their own cannot influence anything with the market. If they disappeared, the market wouldn't notice. If they ramped up production, the market wouldn't notice. They're too small. They're too insignificant. They just have to accept the market price. The other bit, this comes from our perfect information, is that all farms have ident all farms, all firms, right? All companies, all producers have identical cost structures. Right, and this is a product, an artifact of this perfect information. They all have access to the exact same labor, the exact same technology, the exact same capital. So they have identical cost structures. That is, we went back and thought about these cost curves. They would be exactly the same for every single firm in the market because they all have access to the same information. So a little bit going on there, identical cost structures. But let's talk about this price takers again, because right, there's going to be some of you who want to fight with this and say, no, why, why, why can't they influence the price? Let's, let's talk about, let's just scroll down. Let's think about this. Let's talk about apples. And right, let's talk about just again, specifically, because you're like, oh, but what about the difference between like, say, Gala and Granny Smith apples or Gala and Fiji apples, right? There's a bunch of different I don't want to say brands of apples, but rather, um, yeah, they're not necessarily species either. They're little genres of apples. They're the slightly different taste, slightly different crispiness that goes along with them. But hey, all gala apples taste the same. So let's say you were going into the store and you were to take a look at gala apples. And you're there, and here's our bin of apples. All right, so there's a little box. And it's full of our apples here. And this is listed at something like, let's say, $1.60 a pound. And okay, great, there we go, $1.60 a pound. And you're happy with that price. This is, we're going to say, what the market price is. And you're buying however many apples you want to buy at that price. Well, let's say that Farmer Brown... Farmer Brown figures, hey, you know what? I don't think that's right. I think I can sell my apples for more. So what happens, right? And again, Farmer Brown, for whatever reason, Farmer Brown thinks that he has a superior product. And so Farmer Brown takes his apples and they're, in your eyes, still just gala apples. They are identical. And Farmer Brown convinces Superstore or Thrifties or Save on Foods or whatever it is to get a separate bin or his gala apples, and list them not even much more, for $1.61 a pound. And they're identical. They're both gala apples. They both look the same, same shine, same crispiness, same nice shape of the apple to them. But Farmer Browns are going for a buck 61, where all of the other ones are going for a buck 60. Here's the question, which one do you buy? Right? It's like, oh, well, that's only a penny more. Yeah, 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 but they're the same. If in your eyes, when you look at them, they're indistinguishable, you're like, why would I pay more for these apples when I can just get these ones here instead? So what we find is that, hey, if you deviate at all above the market price, right? This here was our market price. If you deviate at all above the market price, you are going to sell no apples. No one's going to want to buy your apples because they can buy as many as they want from the market for the lower price. So, okay, well, that didn't work. What if Farmer Brown instead is like, well, hey, 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 what if I instead 
What if I instead try to undercut the market? I try to undercut the market and I try to sell my apples for a buck fifty nine, just slightly less than the market price. Well, great. Everyone's going to be going to the store and they're going to be taking a look at this and they're going to go, well, hey, there's these apples for a buck sixty at the market price. Keeping in mind, total market supply is a lot, right? There's a lot of apples going for a buck sixty. And Farmer Brown? Farmer Brown's only able to provide a tiny quantity of apples in relation to the total market. So, okay, Farmer Brown lists them for a buck fifty nine and he sells all of them. You're like, wow, yeah, no, that's good. He, they should. They should lower price by one cent and sell all of them. But, but here's the thing. Given that there's so many apples at the market and Farmer Brown's just a tiny, tiny little producer in the scale of things, Farmer Brown could also sell his apples for a buck sixty and sell all of them. So, okay, wait, 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 wait. Farmer Brown can sell all of his apples for a buck sixty or list them for a buck fifty nine per pound and also sell all of them? Well, okay. Assumption of a firm. Farmer Brown is in business, not because he loves making apples, but he's in business to maximize his profit. So if he's in business to maximize his profit, and he can sell the same quantity in both cases, why would Farmer Brown undercut the market price? It makes no sense, right? So in this case here, Farmer Brown would not undercut the price because could be earning more money, more revenue on this one. So... Farmer Brown's just going to take the market price. And then on the flip side, Farmer Brown would never ever go above market price because Farmer Brown wouldn't sell any apples, right? We said at a buck 61, sorry, that's a buck 61. Ah, uh, let's just erase that and try that again. At a buck 61, quantity was zero. So we go just above market price. We sell nothing. If we sell nothing, our profit is zero. I'll tell you, this is not profit maximizing. Well, it might be, but there's all going to be better situations. Very, very likely, right? It probably is not a profit maximizing point to choose to sell nothing. Uh, there's a few cases where it might, but don't don't get caught up with that yet. Um, on the other extreme. If we go just under market price, well, we get to sell all of it, but at a lower price. So, okay, keep in mind, profit is total revenue minus total cost. Total revenue is price times quantity. If in both cases, quantity is all, quantity is fixed. That's why I'm putting that little line, fixed quantity. Well, if I sell for a lower price, I'm making less revenue. If I'm making less revenue for the same cost, I'm making less profit. So again, undercutting market price is a bad idea. Thus, what we get is the only price Farmer Brown could sell his apples for is the market price. And that is because Farmer Brown's product, Farmer Brown's good, is indifferentiable. You cannot tell a difference between Farmer Brown's apples and the market's apples. So no one would ever want to pay more for this case. So that is Farmer Brown, every single firm is a price taker. Just takes the market price. What does this mean? Let's just re-expand this in a bit of a nicer way. That means with relation to our profit function, uh, price times quantity, yeah, okay, let's just back up. Let's do that in a bit of a different way. Profit is our total revenue minus total cost. 
with respect to our profit function here, total revenue is price times quantity minus total cost. In respect to all this, price is fixed. This is dictated to us by the market. We do not have control over it. We would say that price is exogenous, right? Exo being without. Price is not without, but from out. It is determined outside of our system. We do not have influence over this. So we take whatever price the market tells us, meaning what do we have control over? Well, I have control over my quantity. I can choose how much to produce, right? If I have control over my quantity, then you're like, well, okay, Keith, I also have control over my costs. Yeah, 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 we, we do, but, but let's, let's think about that. Quantity, that is a function given technology of labor and capital. Capital is again fixed in the short run. I don't get to choose that. Technology is fixed. So the only thing I get to choose ultimately is my number of workers. And I'm going to pick some level of workers in order to produce some quantity. Okay, but Keith, what about this whole total cost? I'm like, don't we get to choose this as well? Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's go back and think about our costs. So we had total cost. Total cost was equal to total fixed cost plus our total variable cost. Fixed cost was our capital cost, and capital was fixed. So, okay, we don't really get to change this at all. It's just, again, dictated to us, exogenous from outside of our system. But total variable cost, well, hey, that's my labor cost. So this is going to change. But, hey, wait, whoa. I'm already choosing my level of labor here, and I'm choosing my level of labor to choose my quantity. More labor, more output, more output, right? We can say, hey, as quantity goes up, my total revenue goes up, right? Because if price is fixed, if I sell more stuff, I'm going to get more revenue. But what happens? We sell more stuff. We need more workers to produce more stuff. As we add more workers, what does this do? Well, more workers is going to mean more variable cost. So, okay, all of this to say, the only thing I'm really choosing is my Q, my level of output. How many apples, how many pounds of apples I should produce. And by choosing Q, I mean, I have to choose my labor. How many workers do I need to produce that Q? By choosing my labor, I influence my total variable cost. By influencing my total variable cost, I influence my total cost of production. So the only choice I have as a producer is my level of output. It's the only thing I can choose. Everything else is going to be chosen as a result of this level of output, or everything else is fixed. So that is, in order to profit maximize, so to profit, whoa, what happened there? To profit maximize, we need to choose some optimal, right, some optimal profit maximizing quantity, which we will call Q star. There's going to be some level of output such that this is the profit maximizing level of output. And again, the reason why that must be the case is because level of output is the only thing I can choose. That's it. That's it. As I choose to produce more, I need more workers. As I have more workers, I have more cost. So there's trade-offs happening in all of this. There's going to be a sweet spot that we find such that we have the highest possible profit. And that highest possible profit will happen at Q star. So let's take a look at how we determine this. Let's take a look at how we find this. 
So, okay. How do we find that? Let's open this up. Profit is total revenue minus total cost. And then we took a look at our total cost side and we said, okay, we have our average total cost, we have our average fixed cost, and we have our average variable cost. We then also said, okay, we can take a look at that and our marginal cost as well. We opened up this guy to price times quantity. And we said, hey, quantity, this was our production function, labor and capital for a fixed capital. And we worked out our average product of labor and our marginal product of labor. But what we can do now is we can take these together, P times Q together, and say, okay, if price is fixed, if this is dictated to me, I can also work out, just like we've done for product, just like we've done for costs, I can work out a average revenue, right, which would be my total revenue per unit, or I could work out my marginal revenue, which would be my change in total revenue, how much extra money do I get, if I produce and sell an extra unit. So I can work that out just the same. Now let's just let's just quickly back up a whole bunch of terms over here, average total cost, average fixed cost, right? All of this stuff here. Maybe you're like, oh shoot, I know I should know this, but what what is it again? Let's let's just remind ourselves. Average total cost, total cost per unit, average fixed cost. That's our total fixed cost, our capital cost per unit. Average variable cost, that's our labor cost, our total variable cost per unit. And then our marginal cost, what was that guy? That was the change in total cost, so how much my costs increase by if I were to produce one more unit, right? So those were our costs. Product side, what do we have here? Well, our average product of labor, that was looking at, hey, how much stuff can I produce per worker? And then marginal product of labor was, hey, how much extra output do I get if I hire an extra worker? So, right, you'll notice kind of a theme here. Marginal is always an extra for an extra, extra for an extra, extra for an extra, where the averages are just going to be, hey, on average, how much do I get per unit? Or in our product case, how many units do I get per worker? So that's what we have going on here. Let's, let's play around with this average and marginal revenue a bit. Turns out these are going to be kind of fun as you play around with them mathematically. And you're like, oh no, we have all this algebra going on. Now even more math, we're going to open it up. Don't get too caught up with this math, right? This is Those of you who are a bit more mathematically focused, maybe this clicks, maybe this makes sense. Those of you who are not, the big takeaway is the end result, right? The big takeaway is that last little bit, all this algebraic manipulation is just to show to you that this is the case and not just me waving my hands. So let's start off with this average revenue. So average revenue equals total revenue per unit. Well, hey, hey, let's open up what total revenue is. Total revenue is price times quantity per unit. Hey, hey, look at that. We got Q up top, we got a Q in the bottom. Those are gonna cancel each other out. So my average revenue is just my price, right? And I actually will often see this average revenue referred to is our demand. That is our demand is our average revenue. But We'll come back to this. We'll actually expand upon this farther as we carry on. Don't get too caught up with that yet because we have not formally yet introduced demand. So just a bit of an aside for when we do introduce it, but don't get too caught up yet. But we have our average revenue being our price. What about the marginal revenue? Well, okay, this guy gets a little bit more complicated as we work through it because we're dealing with changes, but eh, it's not really that bad. So what's our marginal revenue? Marginal revenue is the change in total revenue 
for a change in output. So hey, if I produced one more unit and was then able to sell one more unit, how much more revenue do I get from that? How much does my revenue increase by? Well, let's open this up. Change in total revenue, right? Keep in mind this old triangle delta notation. What does that mean? That means total revenue one minus total revenue zero. So one minus naught all over. Oh, that was a bad line. Let's, uh, let's try that again. Let's just use the line tool. There we go. Total revenue one minus total revenue naught is going to be equal to Q1 minus Q naught. Right, or you can think about this as total revenue final minus total revenue initial, Q final minus Q initial. Let's open this up a little bit more. Total revenue one, total revenue naught. What do we have going on here? Well, we have, let's go bracket, and then we'll do just a little bracket here. Total revenue one, that's going to be price times Q1, and then we'll close that, minus price times Q0, and we'll close that all over, well, that wasn't so bad, using a freehand tool, Q1 minus Q0. And okay, you're like, whoa, that took a lot longer to write because you want to change P to be the same color each time. Yes, the reason why I did that is because keep in mind our assumption for perfect competition is that price is dictated by the market. So, okay, price is dictated by the market, meaning we just take whatever price the market tells us. And because we're such a tiny, small firm, the market doesn't notice us. If we went bankrupt and produced nothing, the market wouldn't even notice we went bankrupt. There'd be so many other suppliers to make up for our lost quantity that the market wouldn't notice. If we flooded the market with as much as we could produce, Again, we're so small that even us trying to flood the market would have no impact. It would, again, do nothing to the market overall. So that is, as we change our quantities from Q0 to Q1, our price stays constant. Our price is not moving with quantity. So that is, hey, if this is a constant price, that is right, we could just think about this as something like, and again, I'm just making this up, picking a number so we could visualize it thinking of it as $2, well, if that was the case, if that was the case, we would have marginal revenue as 2 times Q1 minus 2 times Q0. And again, where did that 2 come from? I just made it up. I just picked a price at random just to give it a number because often this is easier to visualize for many if I give it a number rather than just leaving it as P. And then Q1 minus Q0. Right? And here if we wanted to be really kind of explicit with that, let's go and keep this as red to say, hey, this is really just my price. I just picked some price and put it in there. Well, hey, we have two quantity one, we have two quantity not. If you remember kind of a little bit of mathematic algebraic tricks, two is common to both of these, we could factor it out. That is, we could rewrite this equation as two times Q1 minus Q0 all over Q1 minus Q0. And hey, Q1, Q1, minus Q0, Q0, whatever this in the top works out to be is going to be exactly what this in the bottom works out to be. That is, these values are just going to cancel each other out. They're going to be some number divided by some number. Boom, they're going to cancel each other out, meaning all we're going to be left with is 2. And you're like, oh, but where did this number come from? No, 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 this isn't actually 2. What we're actually left with is just P. 
P price, right? This here, back up. We just used two just so we could see it numerically a little bit clearer. This is actually that there. P, some fixed price is common to both. And so because it's the same fixed price that's common to both, P, P, it's not changing. We can factor it out just like we did. And then these guys cancel each other out, leaving us just price left over. What's the takeaway with that then? The takeaway is that for a perfectly competitive firm, we have average revenue equal to price. We have our marginal revenue equal to price. So altogether, we can say, hey, my average revenue equals my marginal revenue equals my price. All of these guys are going to be the same, right? So we can just boom, all three of these guys work out to be the exact same thing. So you're like, oh, okay. Woo, what does this mean? Nothing really yet, right? We're just kind of building up. So just take this information, put it in your back pocket for the next few minutes. We'll take a look at what this means and we'll build up on this in the next little bit. So moving on, we're gonna bring all of this information. We're gonna draw our cost curves, but uh, backing up a little bit before we even get to draw our cost curves, we're gonna show how the firm maximizes their profit how this marginal revenue, average revenue comes into play, and where we find this Q star, this profit maximizing level of output. So let's take a look at that. 